thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for, uh, for coming here. It's a pleasure uh, to um, be here. I don't know what be means here. Um, so uh, I, I just uh, put a link in the chat uh, the link uh, in the chat is for my slides. So if you if you get lost, you want to go back. If you get bored and you want to go ahead and look at the slides, uh, um, you're welcome to. Uh, you should be able to see them. I'm going to share my screen. You should be able to see my my screen. You see my screen, right? And you see my pointer. Yes. Yes. We can see. Right. Yep. All right. All right, thank you. All right, so today I want to talk about uh, this uh, work in progress with uh, Tariq Osman, who is a, a PhD student at Queen's University here in Kingston, Ontario. Um, and I'll start with our application, um, uh, especially for the people that may have to, to leave at some point, uh, they, at least they will, they will see the main application uh, of, of our work. So uh, if you have ever heard me give a, a math talk, you probably has, have heard me talk about um, exponential sums or quadratic vial sums or Gauss sums or some mixture of those things. Um, so no surprise that I'm talking about that today. Um, so uh, I want to uh, discuss this object, uh, this exponential sum. So X and alpha are uh, real numbers. Um, and the idea is that uh, you are adding uh, these complex numbers of modulus one, uh, where alpha is fixed and x is random. As you do that, these numbers certainly are not independent. These are not independent random variables because x is the same for all of them. So you choose x random once and then stick with that for forever. Uh, and then you keep adding these numbers. Uh, so if these were, um, you know, uh, uniformly distributed uh, random variables on the unit circle, then you would get some kind of Gaussian. You would be getting a central limit theorem. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm normalizing by square root of n uh, when n goes to infinity, uh, but that's not the case. So if you fix alpha irrational, so there's gonna be a dichotomy between the irrational case and the rational case. If you fix alpha irrational, then it is known that the limiting law of these properly normalized random variable um, um, as heavy tails. Uh, with Jens Markov, we proved in 2016 that um, no matter how you somehow ro randomize x, so no matter what probability measure lambda uh, you use to sample x, as long as it is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure on R, if you look at the distribution uh, of, let's say, the absolute value of this sum, so if you look at the probability that my sum uh, is greater than R. So imagine I'm, I'm kind of looking at the distribution function of the absolute value of my uh, sum. Then after N has gone to infinity, when I look at the limiting random variable, the limiting distribution, this limiting distribution has heavy tails. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, when R goes to infinity, it has a decay of constant times R to the power six, which means that the, six minus epsilon moment exists, but the sixth moment doesn't exist. No moments higher than the sixth exist because of the heavy tail. Uh, we also have a, a explicit control on the, on the second uh, order error term. And um, I discussed in some other seminars, probably last summer, how to uh, improve this error term to some kind of an optimal error term. And uh, this was a joint work uh, with uh, Tariq and Jory Griffin. Uh, I don't want to talk about that today, so um, as far as I'm concerned today, I will only care about the constant and the, the power behavior without uh, caring too much about the higher order terms. So this tells me that these exponential sums do not behave like uh, a usual central limit theorem, although the scaling is the correct scaling, the square root of n scaling. And the surprising fact here is that this limiting uh, tail behavior um, is somewhat universal because it, it's the same constant and the same power no matter what alpha irrational you choose and no matter what lambda you choose. So somehow, regardless of how you choose to somehow randomize your x and, and what alpha is, as long as it is irrational, then uh, you get the same tail behavior. So there is some kind of universality, uh, which is somehow surprising when you don't see a, a central limit. 
Okay, so that was some of the, uh, the discussion about the irrational case. So as I say here, uh, because of the tails, um, which are heavy, only uh, the moments up to the six minus epsilon uh, exist. So what happens for rational alpha is the, the topic of today's um, uh, discussion. So for rational alpha, something interesting happens uh, because the tail is still heavy, but is heavier. So instead of decaying like uh, one over r to the six, it will decay like one over r to the four. And remember, the constant in the case of the k of the k r to the six was universal. Now the constant that's going to be in front of my r to the minus four will actually depend on the rational alpha. And so not only do we have heavier tails, but somehow there is a uh, a very sensitive behavior depending on on uh, what the rational number alpha is. And we'll see how that has to do with, uh, with a, there's gonna be a dynamical interpretation of, of, of these constants. All right, so let me state our theorem. Um, so we fix alpha, uh, oops, I should not move this. We fix alpha in uh, lowest terms, rational. Um, and then as before, we fix our favorite um, uh, Borel probability measure absolutely continues with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And then we look at exactly the same thing as before. We look at the probability that my normalized exponential sum exceeds some threshold r. We first take the limit as n goes to infinity, and then we look at this object as a function of r. So again, it's important that n goes to infinity first, and then we look at r. Um, and so the constant that you will see there is explicitly written here. There's, there's a part of the constant that's universal. There's this two log two over pi square, the power r to the four, which is the same for all rationals, but the constant really depends on the rational number. And so uh, the constant can actually be expressed in terms of this uh, Dedekind psi function. This function here is also known as the Dedekind psi function. Um, so you see, I get this constant like two over psi of q if q is odd, but if q is divisible by two and not divisible by four, I get a different formula. And basically how many powers of two is q divisible by affect the formula. So there is a, um, some of the, the prime two plays a special role uh, and the prime four and, and two square, so four also plays uh, a special role. So you will see uh, where this, com uh, this uh, constant comes from at the end of the talk. Um, any questions about the statement of the, of the uh, theorem? Mm -hmm. I, I don't see the, the chat, uh, by the way. For so the moment, we do have questions. questions. I'm, should, I'm checking. So just to see what this constant look like, uh, I, you know, if you ignore the formula, uh, I just you know, plotted here the a table with all these constants. By the way, the constant uh, when alpha is zero, so you can write zero as zero over one, was already known. In that case, you get four log two over pi squared. This was already known due to the work of Jens Markov in 1999. Uh, I also did a computation in my, in my thesis. Um, here in the picture that you see below is, for example, the case of, um, of q equal to five, let's say uh, alpha equal one fifth. So you expect a decay um, of r to the four and the constant will be two log two uh, divided by three pi squared. And here I actually generated, I don't know if you can actually see this uh, font so small, I actually generated um, uh, 800,000 different instances of this sum for fix alpha equal to one fifth, for fix n equal to uh, 10,000, uh, of course I cannot, take n to infinity on my computer. Um, and you can see this uh, interesting uh, behavior. It looks like it has a compact support, but it doesn't have compact support. And in fact, if you zoom in, you can see the decay. And this plotted red line is the line that we predict from the theorem. So the, the histogram is random data that I generated, and the, and the red line is the, the prediction coming from the theorem. And as I said, uh, here, I don't care too much about the next error term in, in R, uh, but with the same machinery uh, that was used in the previous uh, case, 
we can improve this to essentially uh, r to the minus two plus epsilon. Let's say. All right, so this is just uh, the, the state. So how does this theorem come about? Uh, this theorem follows from uh, two facts somehow. The first one is an equidistribution of rational horocycle lifts in a certain uh, quotient of the, um, of the group ASL2. Uh, I will discuss uh, that. I will, I will actually discuss something slightly more general, um, where because of the rationality of the horocycle, the equidistribution does not take place in the ambient manifold, uh, and there will be a dynamical interpretation for that. Um, but only on a sub-manifold that has positive co-dimension, in this case, dimension three inside the dimension five manifold. Uh, and then after you know this fact about um, uh, where rational horocycle equidistribute, distribute, then we can actually use that fact knowing uh, what we already know about the growth of a certain quantity, which is called the uh, Jacobi theta function, which is a familiar object if you like, representation theory, in quantum mechanics, you know, this, this thing appears in lots of different places. Um, and if you understand the growth of this uh, object, then you can combine the information about the growth and the equidistribution result uh, to get the previous theorem. So now I want to spend most of, of the talk somehow discussing uh, horocycle lifts and what does that mean and, and what are these rational horocycle lifts. Uh, so let's start with the, you know, with the definitions and, and all the setup. So um, you're familiar uh, for sure with the upper half plane, with the Lobachevsky upper half plane. Uh, this uh, uh, upper half plane uh, can be identified, can be used to identify SL2R and PSL2R with a product with, of H with an interval. So in the case of SL2R, you will get H with interval zero two pi, and with PSL2R, you will get zero uh, pi as your interval. And now does this uh, identification go? Every matrix can be written uniquely in this form, where X is uh, a real number, Y is a positive real number, and, P, and pi is between zero and uh, two pi if the matrix is in SL2R, and, the, and the, if you are in PSL2R, then you can find the the angle phi in between zero and phi. This is the so-called Iwasawa decomposition. As you know, the upper half plane uh, comes with the Riemannian metric at each point x plus i y. There is an inner product, and you can use that to uh, to compute uh, you know angles and lengths and, and geodesics and all that. Um, and so, uh, with that uh, notion of a Riemannian metric at each point, you can define the unit tangent bundle which is the set of points comma vector where the vector sitting at the point Z has length one according to uh, the, the Riemannian. The interesting thing is that I'd like to think about this uh, set as a pair of um, you know, a complex number and a vector, and I drew here uh, the vector V, and I really want to think of the vector since it has length one as a, as a unit vector, so just determined by its angle. But if you actually do the computation, if you think about the angle, the angle that you see on the, the physical angle that you see on the Lobachevsky plane is twice what phi is. Somehow this is telling you that as the angle, as the physical angle goes uh, 360 degrees, phi only goes from zero to pi, not to two pi. Right? So the physical angle is twice as the angle phi. Uh, that's just a computation. Um, also, uh, the, the group SL2, uh, since it is identified with uh, uh, T1, uh, so, uh, sorry, the, the group SL2 acts on the unit tangent bundle of the, of the upper half plane in the usual way. So you have a Mobius transformation that acts on the plane and then the derivative action on vectors. And you can see that this action is unchanged if two matrices in SL2R differ by minus the identity. So that means that if two matrices can be obtained from one another by multiplying by minus the identity, then they have the same action. So that, that means that T1 of H is not able to distinguish uh, elements that are acting, uh, whether they're in SL2 or PSL2, right? And so that's why um, this identification. 
So just to, to see some examples in case, you know, just to familiarize ourselves, here are some, some uh, matrices written in terms of that representation. So you can see here that the identity matrix corresponds to sitting at the point I and looking down. However, if you look at um, minus the identity, again, you're looking down because you have gone an angle of pi, but really the physical angle is twice that, right? So you see, these two matrices are not the same matrix unless you are in PSL, uh, and, uh, but in terms of uh, what they do on the upper half plane, it's the same. And here you can see the same for these two matrices, which are basically, um, this matrix is a square root of uh, minus the identity, for example. Here is another uh, example. This is uh, uh, the action of this matrix translates horizontally by, by two. And, and here is another example where this matrix uh, can be identified with, with this uh, point and uh, takes the point i and the vector pointing down. So the action of this green matrix will bring this white vector to this green vector. So that's what, what, what the action looks like. So the classical setup for our cycle uh, equidistribution uh, is in the modular surface or the unit tangent bundle of the modular surface. Um, so the classical uh, case is to look at the, the group generated by zero, one, uh, zero, negative one, one, zero, and the translation, the horizontal translation by one. And if you, uh, if you quotient PSL by uh, that group, you obtain the unit tangent bundle to the classical uh, modular surface, which has, um, a, it's non-compact, there is a cusp at infinity, but it's, it has finite uh, measure. Uh, as you know, the measure uh, of triangles, this is a triangle in the upper half plane, the measure of triangle uh, only has to do uh, uh, with uh, the area is only to do with the angles. So it turns out uh, that this triangle has area pi over three, but then there is the extra uh, phi direction that gives you another pi because of the T1. And so you get a total uh, area of pi square over three. And that's why you use that to normalize your measure, right? So if you do it this way, this mu will be a uh, probability measure. So now on this object, on the T1 of S, there is two natural flows to consider. So remember, I like to take my quotients on the left, and so I need to act on the right. And so since I've taken the quotient on the left, my flows will be obtained by a right multiplication by a certain element. The geodesic flow will be uh, the multiplication on the right by this uh, uh, pink matrix, and the whole cycle will be uh, by, by this one. So these are classical objects. Um, so here I just recall um, these objects. So there is a classical theorem that often you don't even see attributed to anybody, it's somehow a folklore theorem. Uh, it's a classical theorem. Uh, I believe there is an unpublished uh, version of this theorem due to Selberg and the classical uh, known papers are due to Don Zagay and Peter Sarnak, although what they prove in their paper is actually stronger than what I state here. So in a sense, um, uh, some sources even call this uh, theorem an exercise in functional analysis. So what does the theorem say? Um, what does it mean that horror cycles get equidistributed? So I have my horror cycle here, and I put a measure on my horror cycle. In this case, just the Lebesgue bag measure. I have a piece of horror cycle that runs from negative a half to a half because of, of my, uh, of my uh, surface here. I literally put here a horizontal line. I put a measure on it. So it's a measure that lives on a one dimensional curve in a three dimensional space because P1 of S is three dimensional. And then I push this horror cycle by the geodesic flow. Because of my choice of um, upper triangular instead of lower triangular matrix, it turns out this, the, the horror cycle is the unstable manifold for the geodesic flow. And so when the geodesic flow acts, the horror cycle gets longer, gets expanded, gets expanded very quickly. And so, so what this represents is really a measure sitting on a very, very long, if T is large, on a very, very long closed horror cycle. And then how do you test the weak star convergence of measure? Well, you test bounded continuous function. So for every bounded continuous function f uh, on this space, if you test it, you will get in the limit just the measure, uh, the integral of, the, of that function against the hard measure, the ambient measure. This is, this is that normalized 
uh, measure. It's important that I normalize the measure because these are probability measures. So this has to be a probability measure because there is no uh, escape of mass, basically means tightness and all the nice properties that we can expect from probability. Okay, so as I say here, this is basically uh, some fact about the, the uh, weak star convergence of certain measures sitting on curves, sitting on one dimensional curves. Is, is the statement of the theorem clear? Is everybody okay with that? So that's a classical result. So I, now I want to talk about um, uh, or cycle lifts, right? So before I do that here, I just uh, stole a picture from uh, actually an Italian physicist. Um, so sometimes it's hard to draw uh, uh, pictures, but this is a very nice picture. So what, what this does is take, um, horizontal horocycles at different heights, at height uh, 2.0, uh, sorry, um, uh, not, not a different height. The, the height gets lower and lower and lower because, um, uh, because the T gets larger and larger. So this is the T. So I, I start at height one, I push it with, uh, with the geodesic flow for time T equal to two, T equal to four, T equal to six, and the horocycle gets long very fast. You can see there that it gets very long. And the statement about equidistribution is not just uh, density. It's clear that this curve is, is becoming dense in this space. It's more than that. This curve is visiting the space proportionally, is visiting the regions of the space proportionally to the uh, natural harm measure that those regions have. So that's, uh, that's the statement of, uh, of uh, horocycle equidistribution. So I, I, I like this picture a lot. It's, it's, it's nice to see. Although, uh, really, you should know that this uh, is a three-dimensional phenomenon, and here we're just seeing the projection onto the modular surface, right? So that's why here there's a surface, uh, which is the, uh, the quotient by the, of the upper half plane by PSL2, and, and we just look at the, at the, at the, at the horror cycle projected on the surface. There is an angle direction that we're not seeing, but we're also distributing in the angle direction, as I was saying. So a couple of comments about the general uh, uh, you know, uh, area of research. People don't just look at um, um, or cycle equidistribution, they want to know how quickly this limit occurs, right? So instead of saying this limit equals that, you can say, well, take T very large, but not gone to infinity, then you're gonna get this result plus some error terms. And having an effective equidistribution means knowing big O estimates of how big the error term is in terms of T. So that's what I say here, that um, you know, that theorem can be made effective. So you have uh, error terms in terms of uh, Y. Y is the height of your horror cycle, which is the same as E to the minus T, that's a computation. And by the way, in the previous theorem, if you can have a very good error term of the form, uh, Th uh, power three quarters minus epsilon, that's equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, this was shown by Sarnak uh, following some input by, by Zagier in 81. Other things you can do here, suppose you, instead of having uh, the, uh, the integral happen from minus a half to a half, you take an interval on a, a integral of a, on a tiny interval, let's say alpha to beta. And of course, if alpha and beta is fixed, nothing is gonna be particularly different, but if alpha and beta get closer and closer together, you, you basically have a shrinking uh, um, integral, yet the whole cycle is getting longer. So as long as the interval doesn't shrink terribly fast, so as long as somehow your whole cycle is somehow getting longer, you, see, you still see um, the equidistribution, um, even in that kind of regime, so where the interval can actually move. So if you think about what this means, this actually allows you to treat other densities rather than, um, than just the constant density. Because you know, if you zoom in near a point, every density will look locally constant. And so basically here you can think of the Lebesgue measure on a tiny interval. And so you can use this result to also handle different densities other than the Lebesgue measure. So now I want to discuss of possible ways of, of you know, results in the literature about um, uh, different extension of the of that previous theorem. So there is many ways uh, uh, one can do it, and one uh, natural thing to do is to enlarge the space your horocycle lives in. So before, remember, the horocycle lived 
in a three-dimensional space, which is the unit tangent bundle of a hyperbolic surface. So now we want the whole cycle to somehow live, whatever that means, in a bigger space. Well, you could take the unit tangent bundle of a higher dimensional manifold, for example, this was done by Nimi Shah in uh, 2009. You could somehow add two extra dimensions to your space by instead of looking at some two, you look at the affine uh, special linear group. So you take the semi-direct product with R2. These are simply um, um, the way affine transformations compose in the plane. So affine transformation of the plane uh, compose uh, using a, a, a semi-direct product. And I'll, 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 I'll discuss that uh, later in a bit. Uh, several people looked at this case, specifically when the group that you mod out by is this very classical group, uh, resolved by um, Andreas Strombergson, Browning and Vinogradov, Vinogradov by himself. And then if you really want to push it um, uh, in, in, in a very general setup, instead of looking at two by two matrices, you could look at D by D matrices, and then the corresponding R2 will have to become RD, and then you can even extend it more because you don't need to take one copy, you can take K copies of that. So I believe um, uh, this result by Jens Markov was the case uh, K equal to two. I'm, I'm forgetting exactly which one did which case, uh, but there are some very, very general results in in particular, this very beautiful, very recent paper by Strombergson and Vische, uh, where they look at this very general case uh, where gamma is a finite index subgroup. I think it's a congruence in grouping. What, they discuss. what I uh, uh, and Jens Markov discussed was somehow, instead of going high in dimension, we just add one dimension, but it's not the usual um, Euclidean dimension. It's, uh, it's uh, we, we look at the action on an Eisenberg group, and we also add this little decoration, which is a tilde, which I will explain uh, soon. Uh, so this is just some, some you know, state of the art, what people have looked at, and you know, some, some general setup where you can actually discuss this whole cycle. So I want to uh, spend some time talking about uh, this setup here, so I can, uh, explain uh, what the result is. So what is the universal cover of SL2? So if you don't like algebra, then you don't like this group. Uh, this is a group that actually does not admit any uh, faithful uh, finite dimensional uh, representation. So it's not a matrix group, but it's still a very interesting group. So if you remember from before, we were thinking of SL2 basically as a double cover of the unit tangent bundle of a, of a surface because the, the phi direction that we had before was twice as long as the, um, the one for PSL, right? So PSL gives me the surface, and so the angle kind of wraps around twice. So you can think of a, of a space where my angle is, is basically modulo four pi instead of modulo two pi. Well, if you want to unwrap your angle forever without making any identification, you can unwrap your angle, and then your angle will be modulo nothing. So you will have an entire real line there, and one way to realize this, uh, um, this group SL2 tilde is just to, um, to consider a matrix comma a function. And this is a function that looks like an arg function. So this is a function that gives you, once you exponentiate it, uh, basically the CZ plus D normalized, uh, where the C and the D are the bottom row of your matrix. So this is hard to wrap your head around, so let's just look at, at a couple of examples. If you look at this matrix, which is again a um, square root of, the, of minus the identity, you can see, uh, you can guess a function such that uh, if you write down this condition, it, it reads as follows, right? So can you find the function such that e to the i, that function is equal to z uh, divided by absolute value of z, well, arg works, but also arg plus two pi, also arg minus 20 pi, right? So there is a choice. For each matrix, there is, an, uh, there is a countable number of choices you can make for this function. And each of them is a different group element. So this particular uh, one is uh, when this angle is just uh, uh, pi over, uh, pi over. Here's another example, which is exactly the same matrix as before, uh, and now you have to look at the arg 
uh, of, of uh, 2z plus 1 on the complex plane. And once you identify, uh, sorry, once, I, once you plug in y, i in this function, you get r tangent to 2, which is just some number. Right. So, so that, these are just some computations just to familiarize yourself with these options. So uh, as I said, I want to enlarge my group uh, substantially so that uh, I can define a horocycle lift in there. So my group will be the so-called Jacobi group. So the way the Jacobi group looks like, there is this SL2 part that I just discussed, and then there is the Eisenberg group. So most of you will know the Eisenberg group as the uh, group of um, uh, upper triangular uh, matrices with, with real entries uh, above the diagonal. The, the way I like to write the Eisenberg group, which is an isomorphic representation, is uh, as R2 times R, where the first R2 is really this R2. Um, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, but then the last R is not the same as this R, and here is the isomorphism, if, if you like. Uh, but it's, it's an equivalent representation of the same. So now I, you know that matrices in SL2 act on R2. So that's not surprising by, by uh, you know, uh, linear uh, transformations. And so it's not surprising that there is a, a semi-direct product because there is an action, right? It's not so obvious how SL2 tilde acts not just on R2, but on this bigger space, the Eisenberg group that contains R2, right? And, and here is how the group law works. It's a little complicated and I, I don't expect you to digest this. I just want to somehow express, uh, explicitly write down the group law so you can see that it's, it's somewhat very explicitly, you know, the two matrices multiply like matrices do. The, the vectors, uh, multiply in the way uh, a fine transformation multiplies. So you have the first vector plus the first matrix times the second vector. Uh, this and this uh, last variable in the Eisenberg direction um, uh, requires the use of this symplectic form omega on the on the uh, in R two, and then there is this angle uh, thing, and you can you can read here some kind of cocycle. Um, uh, uh, formula that describes the way these functions add or this function multiply. And exactly as before, since I want to take quotient by elements of this form where they live in some kind of uh, subgroup, uh, I want to take quotient on the left of my group, I can still act on the right and I will have my geodesic and my horizontal. So exactly as before. Everything looks like there's a bunch of zeros here and it looks like this geodesic and this horizontal flow are very uh, innocent in, in all these variables. This is not true. This is not true because, because of the multiplication, uh, the way it happens, right? So, so you, 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 you will pick up uh, um, some non-trivial uh, behavior. I'll, I'll show you an example. Uh, in the last three dimensions, in the, last, in the Eisenberg uh, variables, um, uh, because of the group law, because of the way the group law works. And as we did before, we can identify a matrix and, and this function with the uh, x, y, phi. Uh, so that's going to be x plus i, y in the upper half plane, and phi is this angle, or now it's in the real line. And then this is a vector, so it will have to coordinate x1, c2, c1, c2, and then the last one is zeta, it's another variable. So this is a group that has a natural higher measure that in local coordinates, in, in local charts, can be written in this way. You can see that if you forget all these variables, it's exactly uh, what we were discussing before. But now we have enlarged our space. So finally, what is a horocycle lift? A horocycle lift is a curve that has this form. So it looks like a usual horocycle in the SL2 part. And then, remember, you can think of x as somehow um, a time parameter. Well, time is probably a bad choice here. It's like a length parameter, arc length parameter, or a um, scaled arc length parameter along your or, or cycle. And then as your x uh, varies, uh, so as you, as you describe, as you, as you run through your or cycle on the upper half plane, then there, there are three functions that vary with, with the, the same parameter. And if you play with the group law, you can actually separate this psi, which is exactly uh, this psi I defined before, and this somehow pre-factor, right? So these are just written in the same way. 
So basically, a horocycle lift is, is any curve that once you forget all the extra variables that you added, looks exactly like a horocycle. There's just some extra stuff that live in other dimensions that if you forget that, it's a classical horocycle. That's why it's natural to call this a horocycle lift. So now we want to do exactly the same thing as before. We want to put a, a measure on, a, on one of these curves. And again, these are one dimensional curves. You put a probability measure there, <coughs> sorry. And then the curve gets longer and longer by the action of the geodesic flow. And when it gets so long, this curve will somehow wind around your space. And it's natural to ask, does it still visit all the space proportionally to the measure of sets, which means does, it, uh, does this weak star limit of, of measures sitting on curves converge weak star to the ambient measure? The ambient measure being uh, the one I described there. Well, first of all, you need to have something that has finite measure, otherwise there will be escapal mass at infinity. So you have to restrict yourself to spaces that have finite volume. They need not be compact, but they will have finite volume. And so the question is, does the previous theorem, does the previous setting go through in this case? The answer is uh, yes. Uh, there is many results along these lines. Uh, all the ones I mentioned before, Stromberg, and so on. Uh, here I just mentioned one that I proved in the, in the previous paper with Jens. Uh, under some conditions on the group, I don't want to go into, into that. Under some condition on the group, as long as, and this is important, as long as alpha beta, uh, which is what you, um, uh, uh, as long as it's what you put here, uh, as long as alpha beta are not both rational, so one of them can be rational as long as the other one isn't, uh, then you can look at orocycle lifts of this particular form. Remember, I wanted to put a function here, a function here, and a function here. So here I do something very special because this function is the zero function. This is an affine function, and this is another affine function. So I'm looking at a very special class, yet quite interesting, class of orocycle lifts. Right? Every time you choose alpha, beta, delta, and gamma, you will get a different horocycle. Okay? So we prove that under some genericity condition, which is just this irrationality condition, alpha and beta, what you expect happens exactly happens. So this uh, curve, so you, you put a measure, which is not necessarily the Lebesgue measure, but it's absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure on this horocycle lift. And when you push it with the geodesic flow, when t goes to infinity, you get it redistributed on your whole space, provided this has finite volume, which it does. It, it does in this case. So one preliminary exploration could be what happens if alpha and beta are both rational. So that's what I want to discuss now. Is there any questions about uh, the statement or where I'm going? Also, uh, uh, Claudio, can you uh, give me a 10 minute uh, warning before the end? Yes, yeah, sure. at the moment we have 20 minutes left. Okay, just, just, just so, just so. All right, so now I want to look at a special case and I just as a, you know, imagine like a playground, you want to see what happens when alpha and beta are rational. So why not take just alpha rational and beta zero, like the simplest possible case, right? So it's, it's natural to look at this possible. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm setting this to zero as before, this to zero as before, uh, this to zero, right? Before this was a function of x, now I kill it. This was already killed. And I also kill this part here. I just leave alpha. So what this looks like seems like a very innocent thing because on the, on the um, SL2 part, it's a usual whole cycle. And in this Eisenberg part, it's a, P, it's a constant function. You see, there is no x, it's just some number, right? It's a constant function. What can, what can possibly go wrong with a constant function? Nothing interesting is gonna happen. Well, not quite. Because that point, that value that is constant, will actually change, will still be piecewise constant in, in my parameter x, but will jump. And I'll show you an example where that you, you really can see that jump occur, right? Um, and I also want to somehow allow a slightly more general uh, group uh, uh, gamma, for example, something that has to do with the congruence of groups or things like that. And so uh, I want to discuss why studying this very simply looking or um, rational horocycle lift will exactly lead me to the first theorem that I described, the one about the tails for, for the rational uh, case, 
where you get a power four in the tails of the exponential sums and a constant that somehow depends on, on Q. Okay, so, so I want to use this as some uh, motivation. Okay? So how does this go? So when you study the exponential sums that we were studying before, that's exactly the same as at the beginning, yeah, I, I put my uh, alpha of the form A over Q, where A and Q are co-prime, and Q is an integer greater or equal than one, uh, and X is one, though, so that's my, my setup. So it turns out uh, that I, I just give it, give it a shorthand, SN is my sum. Uh, SN is not normalized, so later I will normalize by root N. It turns out, and this is the magic of the quadratic exponential sum, what I'm about to say falls apart completely the moment you replace this power two with any other power. The quadratic case is very special. There's a lot of symmetries and all these symmetries are somehow uh, used very heavily here. So there is something special about quadratic uh, case. And so there exists a function that goes from my big six dimensional Lie group into C such that precisely the, the object that I want can be written as theta, this function, this is the so-called Jacobi theta function, and I will not define it, it will take it will 20 minutes to just define that function. Um, it's a function um, uh, that is evaluated at a special point. And this point has a bunch of zeros, you see, it has a bunch of zeros. But if you play uh, with the group law that you have here, it turns out that you can write this element at which the theta function is evaluated as a horocycle lift, exactly of the kind that we were looking before. So psi x uh, is the, the usual horocycle, and this is now a lift because there is uh, a this constant looking function of x in front of here, right? And it turns out that this alpha that was here uh, generates this lift. X is the point that's gonna be random, so I'm, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna put a measure along my horocycle. And um, the t, the time, that the, the, the geodesic time that we were using before, in this case, has to do with the n in my sum. And precisely the time is the same as 2 log n. So as time goes to infinity, it corresponds to n going to infinity, which is exactly the scaling that we want. We want to study the, the, these random variables properly normalized when n gets larger and larger. So it's the same as studying what happens to this whole cycle lift when I put a measure on X, uh, and I evaluate this, this mysterious function, capital theta, along that whole cycle. So, so this, is, this is the magical formula that makes, uh, that bridges the two concepts, bridges whole cycle lifts and these exponential sums. It's, it's all here. So, uh, but now remember, I need to have a, a quotient. Right? So far, the function only lives on this huge six-dimensional space that has infinite volume, right? So it turns out that I can find, uh, in this case, uh, six generators that I write here. Uh, these six generators are, you know, some of them are redundant. In fact, the last one can be written in terms of the commutator of the fourth and the fifth, but it's good to have it there. And, and I write all of them uh, using the notation that I introduced before with the SL2 tilde, you see. This is, this is not the identity as you're used to. So if you look at, for example, at this element, this blue element, it looks like, a po uh, like a, the point I and the arrow pointing down, but it's really not the same as the usual arrow pointing down. You have somehow wound around four times because the angle uh, is never taken module anything uh, in, in, in this group. Right, so, so you have this generator, this generator, which is a translation horizontally by two, and a bunch of other generators. Um, so with these generators, I can form a group, and this group is now non-compact, but luckily it has finite volume. So how does it look? So I, what I'm representing here is a six-dimensional tile. So when you, have a, uh, when you have a group action, you can tile the bigger group by the lattice. And so, you can imagine this six-dimensional tile uh, to tile the whole six-dimensional group. And every time you move a tile, let's say left and right, up and down and so on, uh, you're just using one of the generators. So one of the generators simply glues this face to this face, so it's a translation by two. The other generators glues the front face to the back face, it's a translation by four pi in that direction, and so on. There's a glue in this way, there's a glue in this way. 
it's deceiving to think of this as some kind of three-dimensional torus. It's not a three-dimensional torus because the gluing has to do with the, with the semi-direct product. So, so you should, I don't know, you can see my hands. When you tile R3 with this cube, what happens is that if you move up and down, that's fine. Nothing changes. But if you move left and right, your cube gets sheared. So if you move right, your cube gets sheared this way. If you move left, your cube gets sheared, gets sheared this way. And if you move in the other direction, the cube gets sheared in the other way. So this is a very um, distorted looking uh, tessellation of R3, just the one that you see from here. So don't think that this is a cube, uh, a nice Euclidean cube, it's not. Um, so now let's see what I've been saying, that there is this uh, orocycle lift uh, with a piecewise constant value here. So now I'm imagining a curve in six dimensions where three of the, three of the six dimensions live on this face, on the front face of this, of this object, and one of them is fixed here. It's like a, a point moving here, and this is not moving. This point is not moving at all. Well, then I act with my geodesic flow. The action of my geodesic flow will lower this whole cycle and make it lower and therefore longer because of the, of the metric. So you see now the horror cycle is lower. Nothing has happened yet because I have not exited the, the fundamental domain. The moment I exit the fundamental domain, this is a picture, this will happen. Suppose I, I, my horror cycle is now lower, but when it's lower, it, it exits the fundamental domain and therefore I need to bring it back using the, the, the generators. So when I'm here, I'm playing a game of Pac-Man, my Pac-Man comes out this way, but comes out this way with an angle. Because of that arc tangent of two that I wrote before, that arc tangent of two is changing the the angle that was going here is now going this way. So this is, by the way, a usual horror cycle. Like this one is a horror cycle. Right? So I go in this way, then I travel this way, then I hit here, when I, then I jump here, then I travel this way, then I hit here, then I jump uh, where uh, I lost it. Then you jump here, again, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there's R up there, right? So every time you have to, uh, as in this picture, sorry, as in this picture, every time you cross one of these edges, you have to use the generators. Let's see what the generator does to this point here, right? This generator is gamma three and gamma three inverse in this case. Every time you apply that generator, it moves that point. That point gets, while you're here, that point is fixed here. While you're here, this is a different point. Then when you're back here, it's back to where it started, and then it jumps again, and then it jumps again, and so on. Right? So you can see that, at least in this case, this point is not fixed in the, in the Eisenberg part. It jumps to two values, at least at this height. It turns out that as you go lower, it will jump from more values. Okay? So this is a... Uh, as you start using the gluing that forms your fundamental domain, as, as, you, as, as you start using the tiling, uh, you start moving this point in the Eisenberg part. And there is a, actually a picture I drew with Mathematica here, because this is really showing you, this is actually drawn backwards, but this goes this way, then it goes this way. And you can see that as that happens, this direction is the phi direction. You see that these two curves don't stay flat on a constant phi phase. They actually travel sideways. So this already gives you the, the intuition that as your curve gets longer, it travels uh, and fills densely, and actually more than that, equidistributely, uh, it, it fills the space, right? So that's what I'm saying here, that the horror cycle equidistributes if you just look at the horror cycle, if you just look at the SL2 part. Right? Just on the in the usual setting, the usual horror cycle that you distribute. But what happens to the other three dimensions that you added? Right, well, it turns look. out that if alpha is rational, then when you start acting with your group that you quotiented by on that point, this will start traveling, but it will travel on a finite set of points. This will uh, travel through a finite set of points, which in the limit. So if on this side the limiting measure that you, that, you, uh, that you get when you do your weak star limit is the harm measure, which is a finite measure. In this case, on this finite set, you will get a uniform measure on a finite set, you know, just a counting measure normalized by the cardinal. 
right? So what happens there is that, so you will see individual points here, each of which comes with equal probability in the Eisenberg part. And in the, in the SL2 part, you will see the uniform measure. So you, you will get equidistribution on a three-dimensional submanifold. The three dimensions coming from the SL2 part. And then you have like finitely many copies of three-dimensional objects. So that's why you get a subspace, a submanifold, uh, which is embedded over which you, the equidistribution takes place. Sorry, Francesco, you have 10 minutes left. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. So. so this is the pictorial uh, vision. So, so here you have the uniform measure, which is just the hard measure on this uh, uh, space. And here you have finitely many dots. And the way you should think about it, uh, how do I sample according to this measure? Well, I can sample a point uh, uh, randomly here and independently pick one of these points with uniform probability, which is represented by this measure. And then I form a, let's say, a product measure of this. Thing. So this is a perfectly legitimate measure that lives on this six dimensional space, yet it really lives on a three dimensional subspace or submodule. Right? So that's, that's the measure that uh, appears. So um, this is our theorem that says uh, that if you look at this normalized exponential sum without taking the absolute value, then uh, you will get a limiting random variable, which is pres precisely described as follows. Close your eyes, pick a random point according to this measure, meaning a random point according to this measure and uniformly one of these finitely many points. Plug that randomly chosen point inside your Jacobi theta function, this capital theta I wrote before, that spits out a complex number. That is your complex random variable. Okay? So your complex random variable that arise as weak star limit, as, as a limiting distribution of your, of your um, measures like that, will just be the push for, the, their law will be the push forward via the function theta of that measure that I described, which is somehow not the ambient hard measure, but it's somehow half of the space is the ambient hard measure and the other half is just a counting measure. This was already known in the irrational case, of course, uh, and in the case equal to zero, alpha equal to zero, and here we prove it for the general alpha. Some pictures. These are random variables on the complex plane. How do they look like? Before we were just looking at the absolute value at the beginning, right? How do they look like? Um, here's for alpha equal to a half. You see this uh, random variable on the complex plane, so the lighter color means more peak, right? So there's kind of a density, uh, histogram here, you can see the marginals. Um, you can see that this random variable is not rotationally symmetric. It has some kind of finite group of symmetries, which is very, uh, very interesting. And I, I think we have all the tools to, to study that finite group of symmetry. I, I believe there is some dihedral group of symmetries that appear here. Here is another case with alpha equal to one third. Uh, it looks like it's, it's, it's rotationally symmetric but the, it only looks that way. The reason is that this uh, point is very heavy. There is a lot of mass at that point. So the color um, plot somehow hides all the details that are happening here. In fact, you can see here that there is some kind of, some preferred directions. Uh, I don't know exactly what shape that has, but I know that this uh, uh, symmetric, like uh, rotationally symmetric looking measure is not rotationally symmetric. Uh, here is another example with alpha equal one fourth, where again it looks very symmetric, but there is actually some kind of octagon symmetry going on here, which is very interesting. And again, um, we we can study all this uh, limiting random variable uh, somewhat explicitly because two things: we know what the what the sampling measure is, the one I described, um, and we know what the Jacobi theta function looks like, which is more complicated to describe, and I'm not going to go into. So to wrap up, I want to somehow finish with the discussion of just the absolute value. Because if you look at the absolute value, uh, things are more, even more symmetric. So if the theta has some symmetries, the absolute value of theta is even more symmetric because you can ignore all the phases, basically, right? So uh, we can study uh, the group of symmetries, not of theta, but of the absolute value of theta, which simplifies the, the discussion uh, substantially. Uh, so there's going to be a different group, a larger group that leaves absolute value of theta invariant rather than the smaller before. And in particular, we can kill, I, I don't show you why, but it's, it's the case that we can actually kill the last variable altogether. 
So instead of being in the Eisenberg group, we are really in R2, right? And, and in a sense, because of this thing, we can actually uh, kill the, the tilde part. So we are, we are morally essentially in, in ASL2R. So we are in the, in the semi-direct product, product of SL2 and R2. Uh, or rather, that's what I'm saying here, the quotient it can be identified with a quotient of SL2 semi-direct R2 where the quotient on the R2 part is really Z2. So this part here will give you a super nice torus. Okay? Uh, but the action is, uh, make, is making things more complicated. Nevertheless, because of these two generators that are here, the group that arises is, is, is one of the classical congruence subgroups that people um, study. It's called the theta group. Everything is called theta here. Uh, and because of that, I can somehow simplify my picture before. Now my picture is not as thick as before. Before I had somehow a four pi thickness. Now I only have a pi thick thickness. So I can really think of this as a unit tangent bundle to a surface. And on this side, I don't need the extra uh, direction. I just, I'm happy with just two directions, uh, R2, right? But exactly as before, the corresponding equidistribution, instead of taking place on this five dimensional space, right? I've killed the last direction, so it's five dimension, really takes place into three dimensional uh, sub right? Because these are zero dimensional uh, and you get this, right? So it's exactly the same setting as before and I'm not giving you the details. And as I said before, uh, when you look at, the, at your exponential sum, it can be seen as the theta function evaluated at a whole cycle length. And so if you want to ask yourself, how can my sum be large? How can it be greater than R? Well, how can this be greater than R? Well, your function lives on a space, uh, G mod sigma, which is non-compact. And the function is decent enough that the only way the function gets large is when you go to infinity, if you, when you go in the cusp. Okay? So the only way to be large is to go in the cusp. Well, the space has two cusps uh, because of the, the quotient, the way the quotient is. And it turns out, and this you have to do a careful analysis of what this object theta is, which I'm not doing, but the, 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 uh, the, the story is that in order to grow, in order to be large, two things must happen. First, you need to go high in the cusp. Right? The higher the R, the higher in the cusp. Well, there is two cusps. So either you go up here or you go down in this cusp. By the way, this cusp at one and at minus one are the same cusp because they're glued together. Right? Uh, so in order to grow, two things have to happen. First, you need to go high in the cusp, at least in one of the two cusps. And something has to happen in the, in the, in the R2 variables. And something is different depending on, where, on which cusp you go. So if you go up here, in order to grow, you need the second variable to be zero. And if you're going to this uh, cusp here, in order to grow, you must have this, uh, so I forgot to write it, uh, equal to zero. You must have this equal to zero. So somehow there is some very special arrangements that allow you to grow. Otherwise you don't grow. The only way you can study the tails is when this thing grows and you know exactly where it grows. Very, very specific. So I want to focus, uh, and I'll finish uh, with this discussion, on these two conditions, right? So here I'm just doing the case of Q equal three. So imagine alpha equal to one third. As I said before, there's a finite set of points that come with uniform probability that, the, you know, as you start moving your horror cycle, you start traveling over this finite set of eight points. They are green points. And then in order to grow, if you're, going to the, sorry, if you're going to the cusp at infinity, you must be on this face, of the, on this edge of the square. If you're going to the other cusp at plus and minus one, you must be in this line. If you're not there, you don't grow. Right? And so you can see here that there is no way to go in that cusp and grow because none of these dots, that those are the only possible dots that you can possibly witness according to your sampling measure, none of these dots is on that line. So as you go into the cusp at one, you don't grow. And as you grow in the cusp at infinity, you do grow. Also, so there is a contribution. How much uh, does this weigh in terms of the, of the whole collection of points? Well, this, this weighs 
two out of eight. So there is a two eight uh, contribution coming from the cusp at infinity times two, times two because the cusp at infinity is actually twice as wide, imagine twice as, as thick as the other cusp. So the two cusps don't come with the same weight. So one is weight two, one is weight one, but they are the second one. One doesn't contribute at all in this particular case because there is no point here. Okay, so once I, I do the algebra, I do the computation, I can actually uh, understand how can I possibly grow? How, where is my function large in my variables? Well, there's gonna be uh, some uh, growth that comes from computing some integral in, the, um, uh, in, the, in some hyperbolic manifold. So I, I'm not explaining this. I'm not explaining the, where the R to the four comes from. It's, it's a computation. It's not a very illuminating computation, it's just a computation. And then this constant that I put here is the same amount of growth for each cusp using these weights that I got from here. So once I understand exactly how these dots, how these green dots are arranged, whether on this pink face or on this blue line, then I, I know exactly how to compute the growth which is exactly what, what I need to understand the tails of my exponential sums. So, uh, so this was the case, uh, Q equal to three. In general, my computation of my constant for my first theorem could, comes in three pieces. You have to count the total number of points in the square. In that case, eight, you have eight dots in the square. You have to count how many of those are on that phase where the second variable is zero, and we can count them. And you have to count how many of them are in those lines. And it turns out, um, it turns out, so I think I, I, there's actually a mistake in this formula. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, this is the right formula. I, I should have erased the previous slide. So this is the correct formula. It turns out that you can compute exactly those three numbers. Again, the total number of dots, the dots on a face, and the dots on that slanted line. And depending on what Q is, those numbers are different. And once you do the algebra, you see all these beautiful number of theoretical functions appearing, the phi function, the euler totin function, and this um, uh, psi function, which is just uh, the product uh, of one plus one over p for all the prime that divide q times q. So this gives you the denominator. So the simplest case is when q is odd, but there is something special about the powers of two. So when Q is divisible by two, there's a different formula. Well, it, it's the same formula, but just Q has to be uh, re, uh, replaced by two. And basically, whatever power of two divides Q, you want to extract as much powers of two as you can, and then the rest appears inside one of these uh, dedicated psi functions. And to compute all these things, there is some combinations of uh, um, modular arithmetic, uh, so some classical non, uh, uh, arithmetic, uh, arithmetic, and some uh, um, congruent subgroups, uh, computation of indices. Uh, so in the uh, formula for indices of subgroups inside one another. And I'll just finish with this picture where you can see in action, different cases, different alpha, different rational, like zero over one, you have just one dot and you see it's, it's on, on that phase, but not on the blue line. For example, here you have, uh, that's the one we already discussed. Let's look at this. You have a total of 16 dots, so there's going to be 16 in the denominator. How many of them are on this phase? Two. Well, multiply that by two because the cusp at infinity is twice as heavy. And then how many points are on this on these lines? Well, four. And for all these uh, pink, blue, and green numbers, we have closed formulas. That's what the the final formula is. So I'll finish here. Thank you. So thanks, Francesco, for <coughs> this nice and inspiring talk, as usual. So, do we have questions? Okay, so let me ask then just a quick question. So, is there a, a, an easy explanation, at least intuitively explanation, for the factor r to the minus four instead of r to the minus six in the rational case? Uh, why why four instead of six? Um, it's really a, it's it's a computation that's not very illuminating. It's a computation that you basically you you know where you know what it takes to be large. You know where you have to grow. So. 
So you have to integrate in this six dimensional space mm -hmm. over a region, you have to compute the measure of a certain region. And this region will be up in the cut, so Y has to be large, X doesn't matter, X doesn't mm -hmm. matter, so where you are left and right doesn't matter, How, Y has to be large, but there is some complicated in, uh, intertwining relation between Y and the variable phi. The variable yeah. phi lives in that tilde thing that I discussed, which is complicated to handle. Mm -hmm. And so somehow, as um, the, you basically have to do a couple of mi miraculous changes of variables and some constant comes out, and uh, you, it's basically some, some classical integral and you'll get, uh, depending on what your antiderivative is, you will get a different power of R. Um, I, I don't have a, an explanation other than it is a computation. Okay. Uh, it's not intuitive. <laughs> Um, and in fact, I even suspect that there could be scenarios where you could get uh, a power that's not four, that's not six, it's somewhere in between if you, mm -hmm. if you tweak the parameters cleverly. You remember I said there were a bunch of, rush, a bunch of numbers and I set a bunch of them to zero. Mm -hmm. But if I, I think if we choose some of the parameters rational, so you don't equal distributing the whole thing, but some of them not zero, you may even get uh, a different power, uh, which is probably in between five, in between four and six, uh, but I don't know uh, if it's five. That, it, okay. It's part of an ongoing uh, investigation. Tariq is here. Tariq is the student that's been working on this thing, and, and this is part of his thesis, so oh, he may okay. know. Uh, <laughs> if he doesn't know, then I don't know. <laughs> okay, so there are, are there more questions? And then probably I can ask also, okay, now there's a question by Marco, please. Yes, I have a, um, a leading question, which is poss possibly I already asked you, you know, some time ago and I forgot, but, but in that case, pardon me, I'm senile. Um, you can imagine, actually, I'm going to ask something of this sort. How much can you do these things? What can you do about these things on, uh, on surfaces or hypersurfaces of infinite measure? I mean, you, you can ask questions about, uh, um, about equidistribution of autocycle. Um, in that case, I mean, can you prove anything? Does it have any consequences in terms of the things you have studied? Is well, there are uh, applications to equidistribution of borocycles or in general horospheres uh, in uh, non-compact infinite volume manifolds, for example, to um, other problems in number theory like um, Apollonial circle packings and things like that. Uh, not specifically to this one, not that I know of, but I, I've seen other cases where somehow you have to, in your test function has to be compactly supported, for example, if you localize where you're looking at. So, but, but then you're converging in a different topology. You're not converging in the weak star topology. You have to somehow, uh, if you want your, your integrals to be finite and you don't want any escape of mass, then you want to somehow use, let's say, uh, compactly supported test functions. But then it's a different topology. So I think, yes, there are results. Uh, I don't know about this specific setup, uh, but uh, there, there are other number theoretical questions that have similar um, uh, treat, uh, treatment where you'll take the, the unstable manifold and you let it grow under the action of the geodesic flow so it gets longer and longer or larger and larger um yeah and it's it is what it is right so but i don't know uh, i don't know about this specific example i know that there is other setup where this is done okay i mean you can still Kondorovich, for example elena fuchs they, they have uh, several uh, examples of that sort all right okay well thank you Yes, Otto. Um, yes, yeah, so as I didn't mention it, but the way Sarnak proved this uh, initial uh, classical equidistribution um, um, w was using uh, zero free regions for Eisenstein series. Um, and this whole group G can actually be written entirely in terms of the shale veil representation of, uh, sorry, the, 
the function theta that we discussed can be written in terms of the representation of this group G. So this, this object that we're looking at, this object uh, theta, really has to do the, with the representation theory. Um, and so for sure there is some analog of Eisenstein's, Eisenstein series. Um, just to mention that um, when you, yeah, so when, when you look at this, um, these uh, representations, uh, you can use them to define uh, this generalized uh, theta functions. Um, and so it's, it's an intrinsic object that's, that's definitely uh, suitable for uh, generalization of Eisenstein series, for sure. Thank you. It's a good question. Yes, yes. Jens Markov used that, uh, that approach in, the, in his 1999 paper where he was studying this case. He was studying this case, uh, alpha equal to zero, uh, which is the denominator is one. So that's precisely that case. Uh, okay, so since there are no more questions, I think we can thank then Francesco again and thank everybody for participating to this seminar. Thank and you. there is a next meeting next week and you can find all the information on the, our website or just in the math seminars webpage.